think we have to finish that meeting then. Uh, okay. <laughs> you take some photos? Okay, so I guess I'll just start uh, in the interest of time. I know, uh, I guess our panel is, uh, is between you and lunch, but I want to make sure that this panel is uh, definitely worth your time. And uh, I think uh, among all of us, uh, we want to definitely share some interesting stories with you with regards to partnerships and alliances. Uh, my name is Earl Valencia, and I run a corporate accelerator uh, in the Philippines. Uh, but then for a large investment holding company called First Pacific. Um, so we invest in a variety of startups from mobile apps to renewable energy. Um, but today we have a definitely a steam panel um, that has different experiences in partnering from the venture capital side all the way up to corporate innovation and even with the city, right? Uh, so we have different types of partnering um, possibilities here. So first of all, I want to introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, uh, here, oops, sorry. Uh, here to uh, my left is Joram Oran. He's the founder and general partner of Vertex Venture Capital, and he flew all the way from Israel uh, here to talk about as well the Israeli uh, venture ecosystem and corporate innovation. Uh, and then we have here uh, Dong Min Chen. He's the dean of the School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the esteemed Peking University. And one tidbit that he shared to me is that he actually is a returnee to academics. He was an academic, then an entrepreneur, raised $80 million uh, led by Sequoia Capital in Silicon Valley, and came back to academic, right? So very interesting uh, story there. Then we have here Laura, who is the VP of Alliances and Ecosystem Development for IBM. And he also flew here from uh, RTP in North Carolina. And we have here, to my far right, uh, Gianluca, who is the Director of International Affairs for the New York City Develop Economic Development Corporation. And as all of you know that uh, New York City has developed to one of the leading startup ecosystems in the world, uh, more known as the Silicon Alley, right? So uh, I know Gianluca, you have a few slides uh, to start with. Or we'll just uh, kind of no, go. No, I can go ahead. The slides are really has a backup so that maybe if I want to show some, some, some pictures and data, it's not, I don't want to go into a formal presentation. Sure, that's fine. So I guess we'll just go around uh, kind of the panel and have specific questions for each one. So we'll go first to uh, Yoram. Is, uh, as a venture capitalist uh, in, in Israel, um, and just a venture capitalist in general, um, what is the best way for corporations to partner with you and for startups to partner with uh, corporations? And what are the successes or the success stories that you have seen over time uh, that actually made sense? Or what are the pitfalls to make sure that startups don't fall into with regards to partnering with venture capitals and with corporations? Thank you. Uh, let me do a short commercial on the Israeli high tech and yes, the of course. Vertex the venture capital. Uh, this is mostly uh, with the data that will back my uh, claims mm. and uh, comments on what does it take to bring corporation and uh, startups and VCs uh, to the table. Uh, as uh, some of you know, about $2 billion are invested in venture capital in Israel every year. 95% of the money is non-Israeli money, comes from outside uh, the world, mostly uh, US and European. And uh, last two years, uh, surprisingly, 30% uh, of the money was raised in Asia, mostly in China. Not only uh, most of the capital is not local, uh, the markets for our technology companies are global, 50% uh, of the industrial output of Israel is high tech, mm. and more than 90% of it, I think 95% is exported out of Israel. So again, not only uh, the money is imported to Israel, but the products are exported out of Israel. And uh, the third phase always, the financial phase, uh, seven out of eight 
Israeli exits are in the form of trade sales, and only one out of eight are IPOs. Uh, IPOs, not in Israel, IPOs mostly in NASDAQ, mm -hmm. and trade sales, those seven out of eight, are multinational corporations acquiring uh, startups in Israel. We believe that uh, we have 250 multinationals having a base in Israel, mostly R&D base, as a result of acquiring companies. Uh, and the names are household names. Uh, Microsoft acquired 11 companies in Israel. Cisco acquired 12 companies in Israel. IBM acquired a few companies in Israel, and they may share with you mm -hmm. uh, their experience. And uh, lately, a uh, Japanese company, Rakuten, acquired Viber for $900 million. We'll see very soon Chinese company acquiring technology companies and uh, converting them into uh, R&D bases, which tells you that corporation come to Israel, uh, to your question, mm -hmm. in two ways. One is acquiring companies and then either investing in uh, VCs or investing directly through their corporate VCs. I'm very biased, I'm a VC, and I think the right way to do is to give up the money <laughs> and we will take care of it. Uh, but I have to admit that there are merits to direct investment. Uh, I'm a bit negative, and I want to explain it through examples about uh, when is it right for as an entrepreneur to take uh, corporate money into the company. Um, Vertex, as uh, you were hinted, is an, Israel, an Israeli fund. Most of the money comes out of Israel, uh, some of it from Singapore, significant part of it from Singapore, and we invest in Israeli companies. Uh, and I will share with you, which will help me uh, commercialize again, uh, um, th the story of our last three exits and uh, the partnership with corporation. About uh, a year ago, uh, we were the first investor into Waze, the navigation company. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up selling it to Google. Uh, after the VC investment, we invited the corporations, and I am allowed to say this was Microsoft and Qualcomm. They joined the company, and um, they didn't like the idea of selling it to Google. Hmm. So you have investors around the table with strategic interests uh, make, uh, can easily uh, get 10 X on their money. We ourselves made 27 uh, X on our money, but the corporation hesitated. Finally, they supported it. Uh, a three months ago, we took public a company called CyberArk. CyberArk is a cybersecurity company um, serving the financial industry among other industries. You want to know that every bank in Singapore is using uh, our product, but every bank, and not only banks, at uh, certain stages, uh, we invited a partner to join the last round. This was Goldman Sachs. We had some issues uh, when we decided to take it public. For example, we didn't take them as our bankers to NASDAQ. The company is traded now at two billion. Okay, so I think, I think uh, that's a very interesting example on you know, how corporate VCs or corporations can actually both add value, but at the same time, it's a yeah. risk to- no, an, I'm to not that company. negative, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but uh, uh, I wanted to tell the story. Uh, the last one was Solar Edge, a solar, a solar energy company took public last week. And NASDAQ and GE was our partner. And what I'm saying is that in most cases, the uh, investment by corporation or by corporate VC uh, serves the company well as they end up being either a main customer 
for the company, which is very important, or they end up acquiring the company. That's right. That's and right. Uh, that's a real upside. Of course, when you consider a trade sale, uh, you don't want to negotiate uh, with somebody uh, who is not your investor and at the same time have around the table a board member who uh, represent the other option. But all in all, uh, we think that in many cases they may end up uh, buying the company or supporting an IPO and this was uh, a real plus. So I guess, uh, you know, talk about those examples, I want to turn on to Laura who actually IBM has been uh, on a tear with regards to uh, acquiring companies and even investing in them. Um, the last big one that's at least public in valuation is soft layer $2 billion in 2003, 2013. So I guess the, the, the question I have is, how does IBM balance really its innovation pipeline via investments, partnerships, this inorganic innovation versus the culture of IBM, which is to develop internally? Is there really this culture clash and how do you sh shelter these kind of emerging startups that you want to fold in? into this culture of building yeah. internally? Okay, when it comes to our product, but it's really core to our product, we tend to develop in-house. That's mm -hmm. where most of the innovation is driven inside. If we go and buy, that we, we actually buy substantially, we, we do incorporate technology, we buy technology. This is an important change in, in IBM versus other companies. We don't buy market share, we buy technology. Then we, when you look at the companies we buy are relatively young companies, early stage. We are interested in their technology and we bring them in. That's mm -hmm. normally the way IBM proceed. We do also have funds. I mean, we do our, uh, our own venture. I agree with you that a company, if when we invest in something, there is some string attached. We do it for a reason. We want, we are interested in the technology, we are interested in the company, and it's for their own purpose. It's not for the benefit of the company, it's for our own investment, right? And that's part of the deal, is you have to accept it that way. But we buy a lot of companies where we don't have necessarily investments. You're talking about the culture shock or yes, uh, incorporation. Yes. Uh, it's real. IBM is a company with a very precise culture, right? And because we acquire technology, we do it to integrate it into our own system. Some of them, in terms of the culture, are happy to, to resolve. Others, you know, the entrepreneurs sometimes don't like to stay in one place for long, mm -hmm. and they, they like to, to move on. From the IBM perspective, it's still extremely successful. We do have means by when we incorporate a company, we keep the resources for some time. There are incentives to retain those resources. There is enough time to do a share of the value, right? There is transfer of knowledge. But again, remember, we buy technology. That's right. Then that's a key element when, when you think about IBM. Then, and then I, I wanted to uh, have the example with regards to New York, where you partnered with the city to grow a certain vertical. Right? That's a different statement altogether, but, right? Yeah, but, but that's actually an interesting example, since we have Gianluca here, who is from the New York Economic Development uh, Corporation and he partnered with uh, different corporations in order to grow. So I don't know, Gianluca, if you can give an example, uh, uh, partnering with it, like an Definitely. IBM, and, and different types of examples on why a city would partner with technology providers, both large and small, right? Uh, you know, and, and what are the complications doing that? Definitely, I, uh, I, come from, I come from the private sector. I just joined working for the government uh, of New York City uh, in September, that, that was through some, because I was passionate about the political side of it, and so I asked if I could be involved. So, what I'm trying to say, why I'm saying that, I'm saying this because I think, I believe the role of the government, if it's smart government, it can be really useful. And, and that's, New York City has been an example of this. If the New York tech ecosystem has grown dramatically in the past uh, eight, eight, ten years, 
is also a lot thanks to the role of the city. And within this, the New, New York City Economic Development Corporation is the economic development arm of the city. It's a kind of a, just wanting, to, uh, just doing that so that people understand what we do. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's the economic development arm. It means that it's, uh, it's almost like the Ministry of Economic Development, but in order to be more flexible in the way we work, it's been all put together into the legal entity of a corporation, which whose president and CEO is appointed by the mayor. Uh, so it's like really working together with the mayor, but with some more flexibility. Our role is not to replace the market, but try to be a catalyst and put together collaborations. And uh, this is actually uh, what you, you were referring to is mm -hmm. actually a great example of uh, this uh, collaborations that work. And the city at some point realized that talk, by talking to the private sector, to the community, the engineers, the companies, that a lot was going on in New York all these events happening, companies come in, incubators all over the place. Uh, we needed a, a, a place where people could understand what was going on easily. And so we thought about creating a, a portal that went live, I think, in October. It's called digital.nyc. We also bought and, and start, started the, the domain .nyc. And we did this with a great partnership with uh, IBM and Gust. Gust is a, is a company that actually works with big data. And, they, would, they provide uh, some of the data feeds, actually most of the data feeds that come there. And uh, because the idea was to have a one-stop shop for, I hate this word, because I also come from the finance world, and I remember when you went to see all these companies raising money, this is a one-stop shop, but unfortunately it works. So I'm gonna use it. It's a, <laughs> it's a place that you can find everything, seriously, virtually all the information you need of anything that's happening in New York in the tech world, from events, from academic classes, from companies that are working, from where to, where to find co-working space, uh, I, um, information on how to start a business, an average cost of co-working space, everything. But the point was how to make it uh, live, because you know, better than I do, a website can be just a, just a tombstone. It's like, it can be very beautiful, but completely dead. So there were two things. One, that's why the collaboration with companies like IBM and Gus was key, is that we needed to have something that would feed the data on a constant basis and, and be updated, because you can't have someone like they just, you know, they're like two people in a little Yeah, it, it, uh, you can do it manually, it becomes too It's cumbersome. impossible, and also doing it in a partially open source so we get feedback directly from people who are participating. And so it's a lot, and also we promote it on all the time. So there's a, it's it's integrated with a, with another, um, with with activities that serve in all the pro. We have we run about seventy in the past six years. We ran about seventy programs and for to support the tech ecosystem as a city, uh, and and always without, always trying to put be the, that catalyst like we did mm -hmm. in the space. We spend the city spend I think only fifty thousand dollars on this project, but the value of that is way beyond. So this is. This is where I think the cities and, and government, especially cities more than national governments, because they're closer to, um, to really, the, to, the, to the needs of the, of the communities, uh, which includes also the entrepreneurial uh, community. That, that's when you can really work and produce results and not become like bureaucratic. No, good. Oh. Let me elaborate on this because it's, it's a very important part. You, you asked me about IBM in the role of buying companies. Yes, but or supporting we, them in general. We with the have partners. a humongous uh, different partnerships and different options. We partner with the universities mm -hmm. and have academic initiatives and we partner with the universities here in Singapore where we help to develop the next generation of developers, we yeah. actually provide courses. So I think we partner with the cities to actually create the environment by which you really drive that innovation. We did it with New York. It's actually very successful. I agree. It's not only the digital portion that is what grew together, but we have tremendous amount of activities, meetup, hackathon exchange of technology, a bunch of things. We partner with the venture capital. We, we were actually talking about how our teams are partnering in Israel, mm. right? Then when you look at corporation like IBM, you have to look at the different aspects of partnerships. We partner 
with what you will consider, you know, other market makers or big vendors. We partner with Samsung to create new um, new standards. We work a lot in creating open APIs and created that connection. Then there are several aspects that I think bring together that innovation. You cannot isolate just in little points. You have to bring everything together. Okay, no, it's good. I guess uh, we'll go now to uh, Dongmin, who's from, from China, but also an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Uh, the question really, I guess, uh, a lot of people always ask is, are there differences with regards to the partnership models here in Asia, in China, versus when your time uh, in the US? Uh, the, you know, the way to earn uh, the trust factor here, is it a little bit different versus somewhere else? What are your observations being both an entrepreneur and academic uh, in both sides, uh, I guess, of the Pacific Ocean? Okay, this is a uh, great question. First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Singapore. Uh, since I joined Peking University in 2011, this is the fifth time I visit Singapore. Oh, so you're a regular here. Yeah, so uh, we are at being a number one university. We have developed a very close relationship with the NUS, with Libby Chan and Paul Kem, uh, with NTU and with ASTAR. Uh, it has been my own thinking that it be, it's important to, uh, at this stage of the history, it's important to develop a cross-border innovation entrepreneurship since day one, mm -hmm. not waiting until a company reaching an uh, international level and then go to another country looking for manufacturing partners. We wanted to look for partners at very early stage that were starting from innovation and entrepreneurship. So our goal is to build a bridge between Singapore and China so you're asking why Singapore and China? You know, Singapore, as small as it is, Singapore and Hong Kong actually really at region top 10 most innovative nations in the world, continuously in past seven years. So it's, it's, it's ahead of Israel. Okay. Really? Okay. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I am the, uh, I'm the international advisor for the uh, WIPO and uh, Global uh, Innovation Index Research. So oh, there's, okay. there's very detailed research proving that Singapore is one of the top 10 innovative nation in the world. Hmm. Yet we know Singapore is tiny compared to China. Right? Uh, first time I landed in Singapore, I take a train from the airport to NTU. So within an hour, I travel across the entire country of Singapore. So <laughs> that's how small it is. Uh, so uh, as a being an entrepreneur and a startup, one of the most basic ingredients to be a successful startup is the scalab scalability. Yes. So you're asking how the hell can Singapore scale? How can you scale? Right, you don't have the market, you don't have the consumer to scale, so you have to rely international market to scale. Now let's talk about China. China has quarter of the world population. China over the past three years have now gone into the number one country in the middle, uh, the middle income uh, nations. So China is on the verge of hopping from the highest income in the middle income nations to the highest income uh, group. So China in the verge of making that transition. Mm -hmm. What does that mean is that China now has developed a huge domestic market. The Chinese, the, the, the per capita income uh, is about six to seven thousand US dollars. So it's on its own right, it's a huge uh, uh, market. Right? Uh, China has developed very sophisticated manufacturing capability thanks to all the joint venture that set up in the past three years. So manufacturing is very, very strong. Speed is unbelievable, right? You have something, they can make it within a week, within a month. Um, China has a huge capital resources. You mentioned lots of money come from China. You look at stock market in last year, China stock market have gone 100%. US doing very well, we are between 15 and 20%. China's value, the PE ratio can be as high as 30, 50, 60, 70 if the technology company. What does that mean is that today raised capital in China is actually very easy and very cheap because the public sector will support this kind of valuation. So you can raise much more money in China than anywhere else in the world. On the other hand, China has a million private sectors. They have very low innovation capacity because these companies were developed through joint venture model. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, overnight, you, can become, you cannot become innovation company all of a sudden. So you can argue a million companies, let's assume in only 20% in technology sector, there'll be two million 
each company can consume a few technologies. So we can eat up two million startups, so to speak. Stock market will support if you merge with Chinese company, go pipe IPO today, you immediately get uh, rewarded by the stock market in China. Uh, China just start a third ball. Well, we have the Shanghai index, we have the Shenzhen, which is equivalent to NASDAQ. We now have a third one, which is equivalent to Taiwan's market, where a start company without profit can go public. Okay, so the, the, actually the capital market is very, very open today. It's far more open than many other countries in the world. Imagine it. This is a communist country. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lastly, but not least, China produced a huge number of talent. We have the largest number of PhDs. We produce the highest number of patents in the world. And pretty soon, we'll be producing the highest number of uh, technology publications in the world. We are second, only up uh, behind uh, the United States. So all that, basically, you can conclude China is the land of scalability. If any technology company want to scale, go to China, you could become multinational company. So I'm going to pitch the point in that China is the land of scaling, right? Because the time, of time is up, so I'll just make one example, That's medical cool. health. Medical health, if you are not worried about eating lunch, let me take one minute to explain to you. The opportunity in China is huge. I had researched China in four years on this job, okay? I was an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. I kept constantly looking for what's new about China. China healthcare is only amounts to 5.5% GDP today. And yet, by 2020, China would double its per capita income from 2010. Healthcare need to be, at that time, 2020, need to be about 10% of GDP. That means between now and 2020, there's about 400% growth in healthcare alone, sector alone. So if we could invest any company in healthcare, you're bound to make money. Okay, just like in the early internet period, you can throw money in any internet company, you're gonna make money. China today, healthcare is just like that. Okay, uh, okay. I'm this tempted is to, to share with you a short story because based on all these numbers, few years back, I think we have a, a few minutes, so I guess one, we can, we can have a, yeah. One okay. minute. A uh, year, few years back, I was approached by the trade attaché of India, and he suggested, uh, Yoram, why don't you join your prime minister visit to India? And I uh, said, Satish, why should I do it? He said, because between India and Israel, we are, you, we are together more than one billion people led joint forces. I was so impressed with that line, I went to China, and try this line on a Chinese official. And I said, you know, between Israel, we are 8 million. Between Israel and China, we are together more than 1.3 billion led joint forces. He wasn't sure I'm, wrong, I'm really saying it. Talked to the interpreter, verified it, and thought for a minute and said, you know what? If we wait three more months, we'll do it without external help. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's so, so, so proportion. The, uh, so the gap between the, the physician and the pop population, right? Every 1,000 people in China, we only have four physicians, okay? So I think the uh, one, one last, just to wrap up the whole thing, what would be your advice right now to a startup entrepreneur in this conference to partner with- Okay, so let me come to country, the very important question. Uh, city or large company? Right, so right. obviously it it's a huge opportunity, but it's a jungle out there, right? China is more homogeneous. When we say China, but China is a huge country and a huge variation between region to region. Uh, we are uh, we're still lacking a more advanced ecosystem like Singapore, like the United States, but we cannot turn the whole country into a well-developed ecosystem. We could develop a smaller scale of ecosystem that which is more uh, in comparison with Singapore and with the uh, Silicon Valley. And that's where the university, like us, trying to play a role. We try to develop uh, an ecosystem through our incubators and innovation centers. Uh, we develop these centers outside our campus. We're in all in China, we have seven of them. In, in the south, in the west, in the north, in the east, we have all these incubation centers. The key is not the physical incubation center. The key is to develop an ecosystem where we have strong uh, champion on IP protections, build, building relationship with the government, finding trust partners to take your product to the market so they don't get screwed in between. And, and this is very important. And this is also very, very difficult to do in China. Um, try, to, try to overcome this problem, we actually now get involved in investment. So we invest in the, uh, in the startup when you come to China, this is where China's uh, own version of your startup, we will invest. So our skin in the game. So our stake is in, in I will, will be part of stakeholders so that we can protect the company, hopefully, in a, in a more, uh, 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 a better manner. So all this has been done on our incubator. So, uh, but still, 
I think we need to develop a more efficient mechanism to connect Singapore and China, and likewise connect Israel with China as well. Okay, I guess uh, Laura and Luca, one minute each uh, before we have to wrap up before lunch. Uh, advice? <laughs> the, the advice, I think they had all of the advice that they, they can get <laughs> right now. But for us, maybe the best advice is you have to differentiate your company then be wise in terms of the uh, selections of the technology that you use. Mm -hmm. it, I think that it, it is very, very important to define how you are going to do it. You talk about the scale. You need to be thoughtful. Then you have to partner with the right, the right vendor that will actually help you to make, to make that jump. The IBM has investing amazing amount of money in driving innovation into the market. And the way that we really work is helping the developers, helping the startups to differentiate themselves to drive that innovation into the market. And we actually have tremendous work in China with, with the universities, with the governments to really the last winner of our worldwide a smart camp that is the innovators. Uh, we do a whole competition with the startups who are from China. Actually, they won the, the global competition. Then the advice for me is that just think carefully, partner with the right partner in the technology that will allow you to really grow correctly. Okay, last words, Gianluca. I have one advice, just come to New York. Best <laughs> world. Thank you. No, don't, don't, okay. don't be pressured. Thank Singapore you. is beautiful. I'd like to <laughs> thank you. No, no, no. I, let me say something because, you know, I, I'm Italian. We eat late. Just be, be, you know, be a little patient. Um, <laughs> oh, we, we wait a half hour before. No, I'm, I'm serious. Like for New York, it's just a quick, couple of quick things. I understand the scalability is very important. One of the reasons why New York is growing that fast as an ecosystem is because a lot of foreign companies come to New York to scale in the U.S. because the U.S. is also is still like the largest uh, market and homogeneous market in, uh, in, in the world. So I see this with a lot of companies from everywhere in Europe. The good thing about New York is that there's a diversity of talent is incredible. And uh, so a lot of companies come there because they can access talent, especially that's not just purely coding. I have this, uh, I remember our president once said like, uh, okay, you wanna go to San Francisco or you wanna go to New York? If you go to San Francisco, you spend 15 hours a day doing your coding, and then finally you go out, you go to a bar, and you're gonna meet another 15 people doing exactly the same thing. You do it in New York, you go out, the first 15 people you meet, they do a completely different thing, you have no, you know, no idea what they're doing. So that's a very important thing. And uh, what, uh, and in fact, with the talent stuff, with, with the talent, pro um, uh, the, the Talent is one of the uh, issues that it's uh, really critical for the city. And we've done, that's why you mentioned the, mm -hmm. uh, we, we partner with Cornell and Technio from Haifa to create this big campus that in the, together with three other campuses, it's called the Applied Science Initiative that we put together with by, just by partnering uh, the academic world and then we provided some real estate as a city. We're gonna double the number of engineers because realize we needed more STEM, STEM uh, uh, degrees in New York. And so these are all things that we, we support, including uh, programs that help companies be matched like startups, be matched with, uh, uh, with venture capitalists or like leaders of the industry so that they can be helped in uh, raising more money and then grow their company. And for example, one of them is called Venture Fellows and we did four editions so far it's all, every time it's about 40 companies each, they get matched with the venture capitalists and four editions, they were able to raise 1.5 billion. So this is some of the things that we're trying to do. And, uh, and we're very interested in also in social innovation because this administration on New York is very interested in the power, you know, with technology has a, a lot of good power, but we're very interested in the power of technology to do good and to reduce a lot of disparities that in the city still exist. So that's my final kind of uh, welcome to New York, and we hope to see you there. That's Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much, everyone, and uh, thanks for staying, and uh, appreciate uh, the panel. I think it's all about uh, scale, it's all about trust, uh, and it's all about differentiation. So and thank now you so it's much. all about lunch. So, <laughs> so guys, there's two thank places you. for lunch.